Yeah. All right, I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Are you ready? No. Okay. <laughs> all right. One, hey guys. one time you should leave that in. <laughs> I can leave all of this in. All right. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> I think for Lighthouse it worked really well. If you left that little part in. I'll leave it in. <laughs> okay, cool. Are you ready? I'm ready. Stop <laughs> making me laugh because I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Oh, I'm not ready either. <laughs> oh, God. Hang on. <laughs> yes, Mama, get it. Okay. Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel and specifically to the Chat and Mom Movie Hour. We are here with um, something a little bit new. Um, we discovered that we had not talked at you long enough. So we are here with a epilogue, a Chad and Melalogue, if you will. So we did a deep dive into Color Out of Space um, two weeks ago, which was uh, one of Chad's most wonderful recommendations. Um, Color Out of Space are Nicholas Cage and Julie Richardson, an adaptation of an H.P. Lovecraft short story. And we also did, in that same movie hour, a deep dive into uh, Lost Soul, which is a documentary you can find on Prime about the director of Color Out of Space, Richard Stanley, and um, his journey very specifically into trying to get his vision of the island of Dr. Moreau made. And we just felt like we didn't cover all of the bases because Lost Soul is just such a rich, rich documentary. And, right. Um, Plus, we Richard watched Stanley, two more of his films. We watched, um, I went back and did the back catalog per Chad's recommendations. I did The Dust Devil and I did The Hardware. So we're going to get in to all of that right now fasten your seatbelts subscribe like notification bell and cheers here we go yeah so i uh the first film i ever saw of this guy was hardware like way back in the day and then i lost track of it for many many years and then like i recently rediscovered it maybe like a year or two ago when they put it out on blu-ray and it's such a great film I love this film. I hadn't seen um, Dust Devil either. So um, that was new for both of us. Um, and of course, Color Out of Space is new. But um, yeah, and Island of Dr. Moreau, I had seen on VHS because my crazy neighbor had it and I borrowed it from them. And I thought it was weird and stupid. And it's still weird and stupid. Um, so, so interesting to rewatch that movie with you, The Island of Dr. Moreau as well as these two good films, Dust Devil and Hardware. My favorite probably being Hardware. You're, are you leaning toward Dust Devil? I think so. I know you well. So <clears throat> I like, I'm obsessed with um, biomechanics and um, cyberpunk. So of course, that's why I love um, uh, this film, Hardware, so much from, I think, 93, it came out. And he did this film, and then he did Dust Devil, his second film. And those, based on the strength of those, he was kind of awarded the job of doing Island of Dr. Moreau. And then he was very uh, esoteric and kind of out there, and they got nervous. I think certain people got nervous, and he was ousted from that and went on a hiatus slash um, got kicked out of Hollywood. And so... We didn't hear from him again, unfortunately. This talented, awesome, insightful, well-read, well-referenced, awesome guy, Richard Stanley, who I love, until Color Out of Space recently. Um, because he was and, living up in um, the mountains somewhere. Yeah, he was isolating hard after Hollywood gave him the boot. And yeah. shame on Hollywood. Um, no I do want to nineteen yeah, no, right? Um, so uh, Hardcore actually came out in 90, and Dust Devil was 92. So we're going back. Got it, um, yeah. But yeah, um, I. It, it's interesting because we filmed the movie hour on Color Out of Space and Lost Soul together uh, as one movie hour. And because Lost Soul goes into, it, it's, a, it's a Stanley documentary, but it's very specifically about his journey with Dr. And we both went back after having filmed the movie hour and watched that uh, what 
these are words Melissa, the island of Dr. Moreau. You got it from a crazy neighbor on VHS. I actually paid money to see it in the theater. Um, cool. At the AM, at the AMC downtown Disney Theater, AMC, and that was was I Alien Three, oh, okay. and well, I mean, Morale. people forget. For those of you who are watching from Orlando or Central Florida, like the AMC at downtown Disney was the largest movie theater for the longest time. Like it had the largest screen. It was like the oh, highest yeah. tech. It had your, you know, the audience is listening, your THX moment. Like, if you wanted to go see mm-hmm. a movie, you went to uh, downtown Disney. But right. I say all that to say that even when I originally saw the movie in the theater, I must have been 12, 13, 14, I can't remember. Um, I I hated it then. And re-watching yeah. it, knowing all of, you know, the, the Richard it's, Stanley truths and my God, what a journey. And right. when you see all of the you learn of all of the fuckery that went on um, on set, and specifically how mistreated and underappreciated Richard Stanley was. Um, right. Because ultimately, spoiler alert, he did the movie we got was not the movie he wanted to make. He got kicked off the production halfway, three quarters of the way through. I don't remember exactly. Um, when. Not even and, halfway and, through. It was maybe like just after pre-production and and filming had I think was just ramping up like I don't think filming had fully started so they had finished pre-production oh, wow. and were transitioning into production when he was so it yanked was off on. it was yeah. pretty early on yeah and it's just such a shame because he was so involved and we talk about this a lot in our movie hours is you know what a shame it is when the the, the director or the you know the showrunner if you will um whose creative vision it is is hijacked by the studio and um, how great it is when that's not the case and, and they have a full hand in their vision from start to finish. And I just wish we would get one day to see Richard Stanley's um, version of The Island of Dr. Moreau because he was involved in the literal storyboarding. Right. He did a lot of the art, right, for it. Um, yeah, just, his art is so good for this film. It's incredible. Yeah. It's so, kind of what got the film sold is like his vision for it, and you when you when the film starts off, it's almost like starts off well in a way, like it's intriguing. It's a good premise. There's some good scenes, like um, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm forgetting her name. What's her name? Per- um, Perusa Balk. Perusa Thank you so much. I've I've even met her and I at a, a comic thing, but I I can't okay. remember her name. I don't know what's wrong with me today. I can't remember names, but um, I know her well. And uh, Perusa Balk, she's even incredible. Like her introductory scene with the um, some music by Deep Forest, which was this awesome like techno group at the time. So they were interjecting this like really cool, like cutting edge of the moment music, which of course now is a little dated, but you got to put yourself in the shoes of like at the time, it was really cool. And she's doing her dance to it. Yes. And um, then it, like, all just, like, goes to hell pretty quickly. As soon as, like, that asshole Marlon Brando gets on screen, pretty much, and according to the background story, like, he was a real asshole on this movie. Yeah. But um, pretty much along with his, his acting is not good in this film. And he's a great actor. He just was not even trying. And, um, right. yeah, the film pretty much goes to shit from... At, before even like you're even a quarter way through it and then it's just yeah. like not that watchable yeah. yeah you don't know if you're supposed to laugh or cry I mean it's it's you really can't tell if it's you can't tell if it's a bad movie because it's like is this just some like crazy artistic vision or like this is a powerful <laughs> movie and it, it ultimately weird. is a powerful movie but it's like it's like you you get to see it because you've got Kilmer at his peak. You've got Brando. I mean, it's supposed to, you've got David mm-hmm. fucking Lewis. You've got, like, major players. You know what I mean? And it's like... it. It's like a bad movie with genius, with strokes of genius, like, here and there is what it is. Yeah. Because the premise, and of course the source material is, like, really cool, so... H.G. Um, Wells. Yeah, H.G. Wells. So, I mean, you can't argue with that. It's a great story. But they really fucked it up, and there's no heart in it by the end of it. 
there's no hard in it at all. And it's it. One thing that was interesting to me is um, David Thewlis, who's one of the greatest actors of all time, if you ask me. Um, David Thewlis was in Seven Years in Tibet. He was obviously in The Island of Dr. Moreau. Um, he was in um, Harry Potter. I mean, David Thewlis has been, he was in Wonder Woman. You know him. If, if you don't know him by name, you've seen him. Um, I was curious, like, it, it was shocking to me that he wasn't in the Lost Soul documentary because he was one of the major um, right. members of the cast. Um, not that Val Kilmer's in the documentary, but it, it, like, they didn't, like, refer to him after the fact. Very much. Right. Uh, yeah. And but, the Lost Soul documentary is so great in the same way that Adorovsky's Dune documentary is great in that it gives you these glimpses of genius of what really could have been. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, there's, there's still like really good lines of dialogue in the movie, I think. And there's like these moments where like you see what the movie might have been. Mm-hmm. Like, um, right. you know, and, and none of them are delivered by Marlon Brando, but like, you know, they, right. they reference there's a line of dialogue where um, I think it's Mel Kilmer as Montgomery says, you know, Slouch is to- or excuse me, it's actually David Dulles who says Slouch is towards Bethlehem, which is a reference to a John Didion novel, uh, the title of, and then that is uh, based off of, you know, something philosophical. So th- there's themes, there's, you know, we were just um, filming a movie hour on the lighthouse and we were talking a lot about the sea and the mystery of, and in the island of Dr. Moreau, there's, uh, you know, uh, discussions about the sea as well because they're on an island and they've been at sea. Um, Val Kilmer's right. character says, you know, the unstoppable phenomenon out there. Like there's there's these, these moments um, and it's, it's really interesting because you mentioned like Marlon Brando is garbage in this and he absolutely is. You, you're getting old Marlon Brando. You're not getting yeah. Godfather Brando. Pat, you're getting like an eccentric as well Brando. Yeah. And, and halfway through or at some point during the production is when his daughter committed suicide. So he's filming his scenes on the heels of his daughter in real life having killed herself. I think so it how happened did... before they started filming. But okay. like, to, to your point, it was like a shadow that loomed over the production. For yeah. sure. So yeah. he, he had Marlon... zero, he had less than, he had like negative zero fucks to give. <laughs> Seriously. But it's so interesting because you have somebody like Marlon Brando, because we, we talked about this in the movie hour about how Val Kilmer, um, the documentary Lost Soul does not shine a kind light on Kilmer at this point in his life. He's very much like a diva and a prima donna on set. Yeah. And we can imagine, like, you know, Madonna in Truth and Dare looks like a saint compared to him. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> True word. But I mean, Val Kilmer, as great as Val Kilmer is, like, it's just Val Kilmer. Brando is fucking Brando. So, like, Brando comes into the situation, and you have, like, these two <laughs> egos colliding. Right. But you also have Brando, whose daughter just died. Yeah. Plus, he's already eccentric as fuck. But he has zero fucks to give, but what's so interesting is he's giving notes to the director, the new director, and he's basically rewriting the movie and saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to yeah. do this. I'm going to do this block. I'm gonna like, do you know, yeah. <laughs> you know how he made this they they found like the world's smallest man who's this like captivating figure in the documentary that you just want to hear all about and he's mm-hmm. this interesting guy um and Brando became like obsessed with him and made him like a much bigger star in the film and there's this great scene in the final film that I did not remember but when I went back and watched Island of Dr. Moreau thanks to you we watched it and there's this great scene where they made like a miniature grand piano on top of a full grand piano and Brando's playing the piano and the, the smallest man in the world is on top of that piano with his miniature piano also playing the same the same music and they're playing in time and they're dressed the same. And this is before Mini Me, um, Austin Powers Mini Me. So yeah. I, I think they, they were implying that Mini Me came from this, but um, yeah. and there's a whole South Park um, Yes. like arc through several um, episodes that references this exact Brando with the mini Brando. Um, just very, that fascinated me in this movie. Yeah. Their the, relationship. The, I guess Brando was kind of right on that point. It was fascinating. Th- those two together. Yeah. I mean, it definitely was a cool dynamic, you know, to have this 
literally larger than life figure Marlon Brando as the actor that he was, but also he's had his largest, you know, and then you have literally the smallest man in the world and the, the juxtaposition is um, visually arresting and, and yeah, obviously set a precedent for like many parodies um, to follow. But it, it's just, it's crazy to me because I, I'm just, I want to see Stanley's vision of Island of Dr. Moreau because there's so much there. I've not read the H.G. Wells. It's on the to-do list, but it's like you have some really great lines of dialogue. You have some great themes, you know, themes of regression, themes of evolution, themes of playing God. Um, all of these right. things are like out a little bit in the movie, but they're just done in such like a shitty, right. way. It was um, great to go back and watch it, but for sure. Yeah. And, and the scene with Feruza Ball dancing, it's just like, it takes, it, it, it could have been so good. good. And, you know, in the movie, there's a scene where like Val Kilmer's character Montgomery is feeding the animals or the hybrids like mushrooms. Meanwhile, in Lost Soul, the documentary, you learn that at a certain point in production, like the cast and crew just gave up. They were like, we're in hell. This is fuckery. Like, what is Marlon Brando doing to us? Like, and they yeah. basically just like all started like to have their own like mini Burning Man festival, and they were just like tripping. Yeah. It's just exactly crazy. That. You can't make up yeah. what happened on the production of this movie. So like, yeah. go back and watch Lost Soul and watch our movie art, and then go back and watch yeah. Moreau. So and I, I you want to? Wanted... Yeah, sorry. Go oh, ahead. I was... Go ahead. I was going to transition us thing... into hardware, but wrap us Wait. up with that if you yeah. want. There was only one other thing that I wanted to ask, because have you read The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells, or no? I don't think I have. I haven't. I went the, through the a weird phase in my youth where I read a bunch of those, like, classic type of, yeah. you know, the classics. But, um, the great illustrated classics. I don't know. So I don't know if I've read it or not. I but haven't either, but... It'd be interesting it may... to go back and reread all of H.G. Wells' stuff. I've read War of the Worlds and all that. And of course, I, I love that film. That. Very sad the, that I the, have. Have you seen the original film, War of the Worlds? No, it's a Tom Cruise abomination. Oh, God. Okay. Don't look at me. I know. Um, <laughs> I love the original film. Good. I've not seen it. It's again, yeah, I'm ashamed. But the, the last line of dialogue in the Island Doctor or a movie is um, by the narrator, played by David Thewlis, um, mm -hmm. who says, as he's kind of, you know, meditating on what the fuck just happened to him. Um, but it's also a metaphor for like the entire production. Um, he's looking out at the sea as he's about to leave the island, and he says, and I quote, and I go in fear, question mark, end quote. And I'm wondering if that's also how the book ends or the story. Oh, that'd um, be good to compare. But it's also like it's a, just a good, you know, metaphor. It's a towards, terrible ending of Richard a movie. Stanley. Yes, definitely. It is. It's, a, it's very anti-climatic, anti, anti and it's also very, like, a letdown. It's very, like, boring even. The ending is just terrible. It's all those things. It's but very let's move into a movie that Ooh. is not a letdown okay. and not terrible called Hardware, okay. which is super cyberpunk. You have to be into cyberpunk. Um, and starring uh, Dylan McDermott and Stacey Travis, who are both great in this movie and both not hard to look at. It's a British film. Um, Stanley is, uh, Richard Stanley is a British man. I love I love everything British. I'm an Anglophile in that way. I'm obsessed with um, everything British. So music and film. But, do you like uh, this, Do I like what? Do you like British things? <laughs> do I? Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so I saw this film a long time ago, and then I just remembered the creature from it, which is like the relentless robot that um, they find and... Um, Dylan McDermott's character brings it to his girlfriend in the film and she kind of like makes an art project with it but in a sense she kind of like it reactivates and it's like a government 
um, maybe I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but it's basically like a machine that the government built that is like a killing machine. And once it gets activated, it just like relentlessly goes after whatever and kills it. Yeah. So she becomes, she's like fighting it off in her apartment, a la like Ripley fighting the alien. <laughs> And there's like a, a lot of comparisons though to Terminator. Like this is the like, right. like this was his Terminator. Kind of, yeah, definitely. But it's way more genre and way darker, and it's way less of like an action film. It's way more niche cyberpunk. Um, and you have like some unsavory, this unsavory neighbor that's like always spying on them, if you recall. And I just really, I, I love Bob. That. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. He's, he's played by oh, no, Biggie Pop. Sorry. He's on the radio, right? Always. But there's this like disgusting, overweight neighbor that's like diseased, that's looking through, like li literally spying on them. Um, but um, I just, I love that. I love the look of the design of the robot. Um, I want to say creature, but it's not a creature. The robot, the killing machine robot in this film is so That's awesome. Big, big and she even, Shannon. yes, and she even paints it with like an American flag at one point, which is all the more brilliant because it's like, it's like, there. I'm not even going to go down layers. the levels, but you can go down the those layers. layers. Right. It's so cool. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to hear from you like what you thought of this film and how you reacted because this was your first time seeing this is a lesser known film for sure so um what did you think what were your takeaways what was your reaction oh uh, okay it's weird to question. see a, a film from this it's definitely from of an era <laughs> so yes. it's yeah so it's again we did our movie hour in Colorado Space and Lost Soul, and then we both went back and rewatched Island of Dr. Moreau. I had not seen Hardware or Dust Devil at, at this juncture, so I went back and did, like I said, the whole catalog. You had obviously already seen Hardware. It's one of your favorite movies. Um, I, I had heard of it before, but I had no connection with Richard Stanley, like the, the dots were not connected, but I knew that this movie existed. And going back and watch, watching what are essentially two kind of B-list movies, Hardware mm -hmm. and Dust Devil from the 90s was a trip and a fucking half. Yeah. Um, I, watched, I watched Hardware and then I watched Dust Devil and I also made my mom watch them both and she loved them both. But Hardware, like the aesthetic of it didn't, but didn't um, call to me as much as it does you. Like the cyberpunk moment is, is not right. my thing. But I did love the aesthetic of the, um, I was gonna say animatronic, talking about Disney Imagineering all week, um, about the um, robot, you know, and like the, right. the machinery. I, I like the aesthetic of it. Um, I'm well, here for Dylan McDermott there's all some day. There's some post-apocalyptic yeah. stuff going on too. They, they live in the future where, um, the world has gone to hell basically and there's some desert sequences in the beginning he does a lot of desert stuff later in the next film dust devil um so he loves that stark like apocalyptic imagery too and i i it, we've talked about in many of our alien um deep dives you know as we did the whole saga um the, the the nostalgia and the kind of time machine esque uh, sensations that you get when you go back and watch these movies. Like even when I go back and watch Terminate T two, like I'm I'm eight year old, ten year old Melissa when I watch these movies, even as thirty seven year old Melissa. So this was Definitely. kind of the same. It was like I'm immediately in nineteen ninety again, and I'm yeah, eight years cool. old, and it's it just puts Black, you in a or what what was the movie a rental place that you had um, 9,000 videos four, six, excuse me 16,000 <laughs> okay. um, 16, yeah no but, but before blockbuster blew up it was like the local one was called 16,000 videos right but uh, still you know 
watching these movies, if you grew up when they were coming out and going back and watching them, is so amazing and delicious. It's right. probably a completely experience if you were born in like the 90s or the 2000s. Um, so there, you don't expect so, it the same way. But like, right, there's something they, they were different. able to achieve that can't be done yeah. now. So it's interesting to see yeah. it. There was no needing to be self-referential back in the 80s and 90s. You know, everything right. today has to, like, explicitly reference something else, literally almost in the movie or the dialogue. Right, and book. Have them. But right. I, I, I did not know until um, when I was doing my notes on Moreau uh, Hardware and, and Dust Devil, Hardware, when it was originally released, had a rate an X rating. Did you know that? Yeah. That's crazy to me. Not by the like, time I saw it, because I think they cut all that out. So okay. the original release. The yeah. Release. Yeah, that's crazy. It is crazy. Because so few movies get an X rating, so you know, like, they mean business, or yeah. they meant business. If it was an X yeah. rating, you definitely weren't going to see this we without, watch like, it an now. Right, you don't see it's what okay. the fuck was about. Right. There, were, there was um, the British, I, was it the British census that had a list called like the Dirty Dozen or something like that where it was it was a list of films that were all like in that realm and they were all either banned or X-rated and um, there's a great one um, called um, um uh, Extro, X T R O. I know what you're talking about, but I'm not seeing it. Yeah, it's like it. a British alien film that was also like on the dirt naughty list or whatever. Um, there was a couple there, and and they tried to do that in the U.S. too, like with music and with songs. Like they had a a naughty list of songs too. Right. Some yeah. Anyway, it's just funny, but through all that. Yeah, I, no, I, I love I love the aesthetic of this. It was based on um, a short story called Shock, S-H-O-K, exclamation mark. Just like Mother. I guess was eventually a comic. Yeah, so it's kind of based on like a graphic novel, I guess. Okay. Um, but he wrote the actual uh, screenplay and he directed it, so... I'm noticing a trend of a lot of our directors also like to write their own work, which is awesome. And so doesn't happen often enough. Right, and it's more of a vision of them. But um, yeah, I love I love any time there's like um, like it's the same with Alien when you have Sigourney Weaver as Ripley and she's in Jeopardy, but she's a badass and she's tough and she prevails in the end. And it's that female struggle over, like, something like that. I don't know what it is about that that so many people find, like, so amazing. And why I'm so drawn to that, like, uh, that type of a story. Your, you pa- get your it here patriarchy too. needs to come to an end, sir. No, it's the opposite We've had of that. It's, like, it's actually the opposite of that. But, um, you know what I mean? I know you are. Um, but so you get that here too. You get like a strong female character, like you get her up against some kind of like dreadful thing that she has to whip into shape. So she just like barely survives it. But you get the sense that this is like a killing machine that would be so hard to stop, the same way the alien is like a killing machine that's so hard to stop. And of course, there's a lot of um, like, the whole it's not that it's a lot of biomechanics but there's a lot of like the cyberpunk aesthetic that comes kind of from the lineage of gear so yeah I so can this see film that. is definitely in the wake of gear I think and um, I think Stanley wanted to do the whole post-apocalyptic thing too he was really fascinated in that and uh Anyway, I just love this film. I know it's not, like, a great, like, masterpiece, but it's definitely such, like, a fun 
little genre film if you ever wanted to just have like a fun it's kind of dark too actually so maybe it's fun is not the right word but um it, it's definitely it's definitely entertaining i love the cast the cast is great the character in the beginning it's so like iconic in a way even though this is like a very little known film but like the guy in the beginning when he's like in the full gear in the desert and he has like the hat and like the like full gear on like I, I don't think we ever learn like who that is but we see him a couple times um that is such a cool character in this film and the way the film yeah. starts and everything is that the is nomad so- is that the quote-unquote nomad i think so yes um he's um, billed as carl mccoy but yeah carl i don't McCoy. I never know who that is apparently he's a front man for a gothic rock group but yeah we never see you. him like Obviously. We never see him behind the the guys of of that character. Right. But he's so awesome in this. And then of course you have Iggy Pop um, on the radio yeah, throughout the film. See, I did not see Iggy Pop coming because I I mm-hmm. did not go into the movie. Like I had not gone on IMD or IMDb yet. I just like watched the movie right. and I did not expect to see Granddaddy, but there he was. Surprise. Um, yeah. But this oh, I mean, film I'm sorry, has. But Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's so steeped in references and so, and, and culture of its time and, like, um, like comic and, and genre and, like, aesthetic and design and, like, it's so, it's, I love films like that. So, I loved it. It's, it's a great film, I well, think. Well, that, that's exactly what I was going to say slash ask is, like, Mad Max, the original Mad Max had already come out, as did as had Terminator. So, right. like, clear, there's no way, I'm not, like, saying Stanley for the copycat, because he's not, but clearly, <laughs> referentially, you have Terminator references. Like, there's no getting around that. And I, I the, see some. Like, the setting is very, yeah. like, like, Mad Max. Kind for of. Me, for me. Yeah. I could see it, but I don't think it's like a direct copy. It's definitely its own thing. But um, I also see Alien, too. Like, Aliens a little bit. Um, definitely. I think all those influences, but that's maybe that's why I like it. I like a lot of those Alien rip-off movies and stuff. I think so... it's a little bit of all that, but it's also that taking advantage of that cyberpunk thing that was like uh, so of that moment you know what I mean yeah I don't think it, yeah, Terminator is cyberpunk no it's for, not no for it's, example yeah it's, so, it's a different aesthetic yeah yeah it is de- a, def- a different grittier aesthetic for sure but um I wanted to ask have you looked at the uh Wikipedia for hardware I'm on it now <laughs> okay so I just looked it up, and I'm curious, like, this, okay, under the production section, it mm-hmm. says that um, in the, by the late 19, second paragraph down, it says, by the late 80s, Stanley had joined a guerrilla Muslim faction in the Soviet-Afghan war in order to shoot what? a documentary. Yeah, the opening scene uh-huh. of Harper was shot in Morocco, and... It says, last paragraph of that section, you wanted to emphasize themes of fascism and passive acceptance of authoritarianism. Again, this is Wikipedia, but, yeah. and that he had recently come out of um, living in the apartheid regime in South Africa, but like, is that true? That he, Can we fact check this? That he joined a guerrilla Muslim faction and that's the Soviet action in order like, to film a documentary? That's, that's crazy. A, that's crazy and fucking awesome and such a Stanley that's thing a to deep do. Cut. He's like, not... he's ride or die. Like, honestly, he's not, like, he's not fucking around. And uh, I will deep dive himself. more into that. That is such a great spot on your behalf. That's crazy. That is um, crazy. crazy. Hey, he is yeah. a crazy motherfucker. Like, he totally is. Best... Look, yeah. look at his behavior. If you watch Lost Soul, the doomed journey of Island of Dr. Moreau, um, you kind of see like more factions of that, right? Like how he joins back up with the cast after he's off the film. Like, and what are you doing? Into the production, yeah. Yeah, so 
so cool though. Like he's he's good people. <laughs> He's he's great. He's our people. These are the people we want to hang out with. I love and, um, someone that would like yeah, infiltrate a group like that just to like gain knowledge very, and awareness. The more I learn about him and read about him and like like I've watched a couple of YouTube things on him too. He's gone so he's gone so he's like gone so as fuck. Like but he very is smart. Yeah. Hunter S. Thompson school of like sure. he is just wild card and I love and I it. And I just yeah. recently watched um because I just recently got the Arrow Blu-ray of um Fear and Loathing, Fear and Loathing. In Vegas. Yeah, and it's oh it's so great and of course I've always loved that film, but just going back and rewatching it, it's aged well and it's such a great film. And I I, I want to read more Hunter S. Thompson because Man, and just when you watch, watching Johnny Depp as him kind of takes me out of it a little bit because it's like it's Johnny Depp, and he's so Johnny Depp, but he is good in it. At like he's good in everything, but um, just well, that like. Can I, can I interrupt you that, about like, that? I, did yeah. you when, when did you first see it though? Did you see it after Johnny Depp had like done Pirates and all started do like all oh, these no. characters? It was way before came out? that. It was okay. before that, but I still knew of him, like, with Edward Scissorhands and stuff like that. I mean, I still, okay. you know, I had I had a I'll knowledge of, of him as kind of a heartthrob character. And he is so oh. good-looking. He doesn't have, he's not, he's not a character actor. So they gave him the bald cap, and they gave him all of that. And he's capable of doing anything because he's talented. But I think sometimes... I give you that. He's not a character actor. He's not a, I don't want to say he can't be a character actor because he's talented. He is. So I'm not taking that away from him. But having said that, he doesn't have, he, he still has such a, like a good looking face and such like a typical actor face that it doesn't look sure. like Hunter S. Thompson. It looks like okay, Johnny so Depp. And a lot of times you have these actors that become celebrities in addition to being actors. Tom right. Cruise, Johnny Depp, you could name a million, or not a million, but you could name a bunch of them. And when that happens, like when um, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman did Eyes Wide Shut with Kubrick, it kind of takes you out of the excellence of Kubrick because your focus is a little bit broken I'll by get, the celebrity I'll, I'll, of that relationship, right? I'll so it it's a... Yeah. Yes. We went down a rabbit hole, but you get what I'm saying. No. So the yeah. celebrity and the fact that you know this person from their greater body of work in more detail than you do some other actors, maybe. And it's hard to explain, but there's a lot of levels to it. No, but no, anyway, he's they... still great in it. Of course he's great in it. He's giant up and he's good. But um, he's definitely not Hunter S. Thompson. But it's so cool to see him have Hunter S. Thompson's like swagger. And just, it makes you want to be, like, Hunter S. Thompson. And, like, it makes you want to be this guy and, and live his adventures and stuff. And I don't know how we got down this rabbit hole. But, um... Because uh, Stanley, yeah. uh, Stanley is Gonzo. And then we got right. to Hunter. But yeah. I, I, they're both, they're both Gonzo, but that. they're both so smart, too, right? Which was, was yeah. what makes their art viable. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think... I, I agree with you that Johnny Depp is not a character actor because when he plays like fantastical characters, like let's say um, Jack it's Sparrow Johnny. or Edward Williams, right. it works. But when he plays historical characters, like when he played Whitey Bulger or some of like the more like recent historic, it, it doesn't, he takes you out of it because all you see is Johnny Depp as. But right. Even, I even, when, that, even when I see him as just, in Pirates, versus like um any other role i still see him like as right. as that character as Jack sure. Sparrow, he yes. doesn't disappear into the character fully except for um, me agree. and i think you're you're also correct with kidman and Cruz because they were also at the peak of their marriage and celebrity fame dumb as right uh, and, and and not to take away from either of their performances in eyes by chet because i think that they fucking killed that shit but you're sure. absolutely right does take you out just a scotch because you you do a scotch yeah. 
But you do you do see Kidman and Cruz, oh, and um, but with Johnny with uh, excuse me with Hunter S. Thompson, um, you mentioned that because Johnny Depp is so good looking, I, I would argue Hunter S. Thompson is fucking hot as shit. So um, okay. When Hunter S. Thompson was a younger man, I think Hunter S. Thompson was out of shit. So, yeah, good looking, but more a, a little quirkier. Johnny Depp has that like very like straight nose, angular jaw. Yeah. Like it's it's a very specific look that is different from Hunter. Look, yeah, I and think. clearly Johnny Depp was doing more of a character. Char- as much as he. If you watch the documentaries, we're going off on a huge tangent here. I promise I'm almost done. But if you watch the documentary, um, I'll have to look it up and you won't get below. But there's a documentary about the making of Fear and Loathing when mm-hmm. Hunter was still alive. Johnny Depp and Hunter were hanging out. I just um, saw that, yep. They, Johnny Depp, I think, really did him justice. But it was still very much a caricature, caricature, caricaturization. <laughs> um, yes. The, sure. the deeper I get into my setter home, the harder it is to say character. There's always a trade-off, right? Because Johnny Depp, by his very nature, is extending it to a broader audience. That's how a lot of people see it. And it is the truth of it. So I think that it, there's always like a trade-off. Like Johnny Depp is like when he does the, um, the newer, um, and we've talked a lot about this, but um, uh, oh, what it, I can't remember any names today. It's the perspective. Okay. No, it's, it's because the director of, the director of what? Of Beetlejuice and um, Tim. Tammy Tim, Tim Burton. Tim Burton, yes. All you had to say is Tim. Tim Burton. Um, so, when, so we've talked about his kind of decline, but it's funny because Giant Up like carries a lot of those productions, like he carries them. But um, also, um, he makes them accessible. He makes the weirdness accessible to non-weird, attracted people. Name so it, yeah. It's the mainstream streamization Perfect. of this, like, Perfect. more underground aesthetic and culture. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You named <laughs> okay. it. Let's transition into Dust Devil. Let's go into Dust Devil. <laughs> yeah. I think we both were surprised and loved Dust Devil uh, or liked it a lot and were surprised by it. Um, there's some a lot of like mythology in this and there's a character that, who's like literally the devil in this. And I had never seen this until recently. It was on my bucket list. I'm glad we we watched it. And um, uh, who's the actor that plays the main character? That's what I'm looking up right now because he's a guy that has been in everything, but you don't like he's not a guy in like an A-lister, so you don't know him. Robert by name. John Burke. John Burke. Yes. And oh he was, my! I was telling God. you that he is the main guy in um, the Stephen King adaptation of Stephen King's um, Sinner. Yes. Which it, I I always I I recognize not like the greatest movie ever made or whatever but I just love that story so I always love that movie and he's good in that movie and um I just really that's one of the better Stephen King adaptations of like the lesser famous ones because right. there's like the I can't like The Shining of course you have like the top tier and then you have like you go a little bit deeper and then there's like a group at the bottom that never were really that successful I guess at 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 adaptation and also popularity and thinner is kind of in that range but for me it's the top tier in that lower range i agree um and so I, think he's great. I haven't seen since i saw it in the theater with my mom so i must have been like 12 ish um so it, it's also on my to-do list to go back and watch that and in the mouth of madness which is one of your favorite movies um but yeah this this guy john david bird is like but he's been so, he's been on a lot of televisions. Like when you see him, it's like, I don't right. know who that is. Well, you might not know him by name, but my God is what, oh, so thirsty for him as a younger right. man. What oh, a beautiful, beautiful man. Beautiful. Oh, my Very God. handsome. He was in Robocop 3, apparently. Um, Sinner, he was in The Sopranos. Um, so, oh. done a lot of stuff all over the place. Um, looking through his other stuff. He was in Black Klansman. 
which I thought was a good movie, which is a recent movie, 2018. Oh my god, yes, she was like the, the he, he had the chief of police or whatever. Chief Bridges, yes. Okay, there it is. Good stuff. I I agree with you, like, what struck me about this movie, uh, much like hardware, is two things. It, it took me back in time to, like, that more simple, um, not simple time in filmmaking, but, like, where Word. everything was so self-referential it was just like this is a movie watch it True. um but yeah. there's so this movie is so layered with mythology like and symbolism like from like the opening shots like you're just like desert ravens crows a uh, guy in the duster uh grim reaper it's just like oh my god Carnage. and i remember messaging you and being like i'm getting heavy stephen king uh gunslinger yeah. by where like yeah. he drew probably a lot gunslinger. from king yeah the gunslinger from the the series of books that's just called the um dark, dark tower Titan. right so yeah. yeah so the first novel in the dark tower series the gunslinger this is like right out of that but which they still need to adapt properly I mean, yeah i haven't even watched the mcconaughey elva version i will I not watch i will um, you can't cram all that into one like action film no um what's what's interesting about this movie though is it takes place in south africa and not during but shortly after well no maybe it does still take place during apartheid um the movie came out in 92 i'm not sure exactly when apartheid ended but this movie like one of its major themes and undertones is is like the effects of apartheid on south africa um, and you have um, this amazing character called the Snake Father, um, Kutin Kangaroo, the Snake Father, who's played by an actual Aboriginal um, actor. Um, th there's just like, there's, this movie is so brilliant. I mean, even going back and watching it, and it's dated as fuck, but it's also like, it holds up. It's just probably yeah. more relevant now than it was then. I don't know. Yeah, and it says that the previous film Hardware was made for one million and grossed over seventy million worldwide. So that wow. put him on a lot of people's radars to then go make this movie. Um, it was shot entirely on location in Nam <laughs> Namibia. Yeah, yeah. Um, and reinterprets the story of a South African killer known as Nahadib. Nahadib. Okay. So it's, I guess, like a local story. Um, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, there's a lot of symbolism and it's like very interesting and you get kind of an, a post-apocalyptic vibe in this as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think these two films are great. And then these films are what set him up to do Island of Dr. Moreau, which was a disaster. They're like, oh, well, we, we thought those films looked pretty good. Let's give them this right. giant American film. And yeah. then then one guy, I think, got cold feet and it all got yanked out from under him, unfortunately. Because now look at Color Out of Space. That's a great film. And right? I really hope I mean, his, his other two um, H.P. Lovecraft adaptations that you mentioned that he was trying to produce actually do get produced and, and released because... I am Me too. here for everything Stanley now, and I, I'm hoping that Colorado Space is a renaissance for him. I mean, oh, watching Dust it Devil is like, yeah, it already is. I'm so glad you love Dust Devil so much, because I loved it too, and this, he totally is already having a, re a renaissance right now, yeah. and I just hope it continues the way a proper renaissance should with a Same. few more films, because um, boy, does he deserve it, and he's such a thoughtful, interesting, as as you say, like Gonzo type of character, and um, we need more people like that for sure. Yeah, um, and it's Aaron, interesting. Like, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was gonna say, like, the, there's a lot of in the plot of Dust Devil, which is you know, long story short, like this kind of Grim Reaper esque character who kind of is on earth and he's killing people and harvesting excuse me their souls in order to to live but
but is also doing so um, because it believes that um, by killing human beings, you are releasing them from like the cycle of, of karma and um, and that it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, right. And there's just like this, this um, there's a lot of things in this movie, but the, the big one is like death, you know, birth, death and resurrection. And that kind of is very much like what Stanley is going through right now in his career is, That's you know, true. He made these movies in the 90s, you know, he had this horrible death career-wise with Island of Dr. Moreau, and now with Color Out of Space, and hopefully what comes next, like, we're gonna see, like, the rebirth, and I, yeah, I just, I, I love Dust I'm Devil. I'm here for it. I yeah, so. Dust Devil, to me, like, is almost like reading a book, like, it's so, like, there was That's so much there. Too. Yeah. That's very true, definitely. I mean, it could be, I, I feel like it lends itself to novelization really well. Someone should mm. um, do a novelization of it. I love movie novelizations, by the way. Um, no. <laughs> I have a bunch of them. But uh, so apparently, like, 20 minutes of footage was removed from the American cut of this film. So I'm wondering if we saw the American cut. Or what mm. we saw. I think we probably saw the American cut of the film based on the quality of it. And I think they removed 20 minutes of that. So I guess there's like a longer version. Um, and I think there's been like a director's cut and it's come back out on Blu-ray and stuff like that. Which is now out of print, of course. Damn it. Which I would love to have. I have hardware on Blu-ray, but I do not have Dust Devil on Blu-ray. Oh man, like oh. there's even like, <laughs> I, I would like if I, I'm assuming they saw the American version too, and it'd be interesting to see like the extended cut. But there's just such like there's dialogue that holds up in this movie too. Like, um, I don't remember who said it, but like d somebody was referencing the Death Devil. John David Burke's character and um, their kind as like Grim Reapers, if you will, and saying there's only movement towards the light and away from it. Um, you know, uh, there's this, it has great imagery utilizing like mirrors and like the, like what is a mirror? And um, it, yeah. somebody says when she looks into the mirror, she'll see her shadow. Like it's, it's just, I There's think, just so much going on. In this I think movie people are so afraid good. to do some of that stuff now that was done then. Yeah. You know, like they're afraid it'll either be not enough or cheesy or whatever. But like, clearly parts of us were longing for that. Because when we saw it in this film, we were like, oh, right on. Like, pretty cool. And, and it also, I mean, it can't be undersold, um, in my opinion, that it's a film that was a like sci-fi narrative if you will or like a a post-apocalyptic narrative but it was very much steeped in history and what was going on politically and culturally at the time was apartheid right. uh, i think that's amazing and then it, it also had not only aboriginal characters but aboriginal actors and talked about right. their and their spirituality and so wove cool. that into the larger narrative and i mean yeah we need more of that and <laughs> we it, need more it of that. has it has a great narration, which a lot of his films do. He's such a great writer. Um, he's he's great with words. Um, here, I have a quote from the very end of the film. The film ends with yes. Joe saying, the desert knows her name now. He has stolen mm -hmm. both her eyes. When she looks into a mirror, she will see his spirit like a shawl, blowing tatters around her shoulders in a haze. And beyond the dim horizon, a tapestry unfolding of the avenues of evil and all of history set ablaze. It's pretty fucking awesome. It is pretty fucking awesome. I mean, the use, like the the use of mirror, and like I was getting a lot of like Alice in Wonderland, who's looking glass moments in this movie. Yes. I mean, I yeah, can't. Yeah, I'm here like, for that. I, I can't. I mean, what do you what do you want? What else can I say? And, it, and the movie's funny, it's too. Like, it, we have, right. <laughs> but I can say one more thing. But, but the movie's funny, right. though. It has, like, jokes in it. Like, there's there's a, there's a moment where um, somebody says, God, you're from Texas. 
Um, and then <laughs> they're talking to the dust devil. They're talking to the Grim Reaper character. And so he's like, because he's wearing like a duster and like a hat. And like, he looks yeah. like a gunslinger. One yeah. of the guys says, God, uh, you're from Texas? And he says, no, uh, uh, I'm from the other side of the mirror. <laughs> How brilliant is that? That's, that's, that's fucking I'm not from awful. Texas. I'm from the fucking fourth dimension, bitch. Get with the yeah. program. We yeah. dress like we're from Texas. Um, I'm just very grateful for you to introduce me to Stanley and this movie because it's... And I'm, am, am I wrong to say okay. that Dust Devil is like a sexy movie, too? Because it's gory and it's, it's hellish. But it's also sexy. I, like, everyone in it is attractive. Yeah. My first note is sex scene. Wendy gets slapped. Like, there's a sex scene like, very early on in the movie. And this yeah. bitch gets slapped. And it's very sexy. Yeah, well, and that well, actor is great. He's very sexy, I think. And I think mm-hmm. she's she's great in it, too. Um, yeah. Is it Terry Norton? I wonder if I don't know. Was... Let me see. I'll I'll research it. But the main actress, it might be Chelsea Field. She she's great. The detect the, the African American, or maybe he's just South African. The detective, and then the gentleman, the the Aboriginal gentleman. Mm-hmm. It's just a great. I want more Richard Stanley. Like. Yeah. I want Richard Stanley's Moreau too. Yes. So oh have we said it all? Or is there anything else we need to say about Stan? Said it all. In the words of the great Howard Stern, we've said it all. <laughs> you've well, said with it that, all. You said it all and then some. Um welcome <laughs> uh to your first chat in Melalog. Um yes, we Richard Stanley. I give it five mils out of five, Chad. Yeah. You give Richard Stanley how many Chads out of Chad? I mean, it's a five out of five. This is an underrated director. If you're looking to do a, a little bit of a deeper dive on on find a new director and a new voice to appreciate, here's a new voice for you to appreciate. Someone who's extremely well read and uh, extremely and writes dialogue extremely well and underrated and all of that and has been off the off the scene for a while and is now making a comeback. What more can you ask for? So, not much. I could ask for my earbuds to sing, and they just fall out again. Uh, I saw that. No, um, but, I'm uh, ever yeah, good that's a- you for introducing me to him, and I concur. If you guys are cinephiles and want to be introduced to some something new and original, um, Richard Stanley, please watch Lost Soul, the documentary, and that will give you all of the context for all of this and then we'll link the actual color out of space also movie hour and yeah with that um cheers and we will see you on the other side see ya on the other side of the mirror yes